Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for waking up this morning uh, to be here with us. Uh, again, my name is Magda Balazinska. Uh, just like yesterday, I will actually keep my mask on while giving this keynote. I really talk, you know, I worry about your safety and I'll be talking here for 45 minutes. Uh, I did take, take the antigen test uh, this morning and it was negative, Woohoo! but I will nevertheless uh, retain my mask uh, just for added safety. So again, thank you everyone for being here today. And I'm really excited to have a chance to tell you about some of the work that we have been doing in the database group at the University of Washington in the area of video data management. But I think what is truly exciting about this area is that it's such still a new, exciting, broad field that there are many opportunities for additional members and other people contributing. So I think this should be, I hope, an inspiring talk for all, especially the PhD students. There are a lot of interesting research questions that are wide open in this area. And speaking of PhD students, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, the work that I will be talking about was primarily done by the PhD student in the stop row. Two of them, Brandon and Amrita, already graduated. The other ones uh, are at the University of Washington. And actually, Maureen and Anna Howe are here today, so you can find them during uh, the break if you want to chat. Also, thank you to the wonderful collaborators uh, in the second row. And big thanks to our sponsors, in particular, the National Science Foundation, who was the main sponsor for the work that I will be presenting. Right, so just like, <clears throat> just like we uh, talked about yesterday, we are working on video data management because there really is a great need for uh, this kind of data. And this need comes from the combination of three trends. On one hand, cameras are everywhere. Whether we look at city streets you know, around our homes, uh, cameras that we carry around with us, cameras in nature, cameras in you know, autonomous vehicles. At the same time, we can now afford large amounts of storage, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's in you know, physical devices that we purchase to actually keep around a lot of this data and do something with it. But importantly, thanks to advances in computing and thanks to you know, availability of large amounts of hardware, we can now actually query this video data and really understand the content, not just you know, the colors and the shapes, but truly understand the semantics of what is in our videos. Uh, so as a result, we see a lot of applications that are trying to use, kind of collect large amounts of videos and use them in different ways. And we kind of see the typical two broad classes of uh, workloads. On one hand, we have a lot of applications that are analytical in nature. And this is for those of you who were here at the session yesterday, that was really the focus of the session. Um, different contexts, whether from science to, you know, to uh, uh, individuals, people collect large amounts of data and they want to run read queries on top of that data. Selection queries, aggregation queries, you know, trajectories, complex queries, but fundamentally the goal is to have a video and ask a question about the video and get the answer. The other set of workloads uh, are what I call processing workloads. Uh, so this is the case where I have a video, like in this case, I have the video at the bottom and I want to do some transformations to that video, like maybe change the colors, you know, maybe combine it with some other videos, annotate it, and then uh, generate it. It's not quite transaction processing in the sense of there aren't necessarily really challenges around the transactional aspect. Although as we were discussing, I think with the data lake stock yesterday, we definitely want some uh, basic transactional support to at least you know, have kind of good properties if many people uh, try to you know, update the same files at the same time. But fundamentally for us, the data management uh, community, we have this exciting new kind of data and workloads that both want to do analytics and processing on top of that data. And what this means for us is we can kind of step back and think about a usual, uh, the usual stack that we provide to our users, right? Normally when users want to use a data management system for whatever data they have, they're going to have some kind of query interface at the top some kind of data model that we expose. Typically, you know, for relational data, it's the relational model. Uh, they have SQL and they write their applications at that level all declaratively. And then it is our job to do all kinds of optimizations for them underneath. And in the context of video data management, we have a chance to really rethink that stack, rethink the data models, rethink the data storage, and rethink everything that uh, happens in between. Uh, so the Key question for our community is really, what does it mean to build a new kind of system for this type of data, a new type of video database management system? 
Uh, so some of you who might have more gray hair here will tell me, hey Magda, you know, back in the 1990s, uh, we did this great project and that's true. There was a lot of really cool work from our community and other communities back in the 1990s already and early 2000s around video data management. Uh, these systems would typically provide uh, content retrieval capabilities and would focus on features such as shapes, colors, you know, uh, texture, uh, motion. What really has changed and the reason why our community and others are going back into uh, this area is really kind of this third new um, component, which is advances in especially deep learning. So advances in generally computer vision, uh, thanks to large amounts of storage and large amounts of data, and thanks to powerful compute that we can now really understand and query not just shapes and colors and motion, but also actual semantics. I wanna see cars next to pedestrians. I want to see deer that are walking in nature, et cetera. And this is why we have this kind of reinvigoration of research uh, in the space and a lot of new opportunities for contributions. So again, I showed the same slide yesterday. This is to illustrate that our community has already been doing and other you know, adjacent communities, a lot of work in this space uh, in, at different levels from you know, efficient data flow processing to efficient query processing, uh, to compositional queries, to uh, storage. Uh, the slide is not exhaustive. So if, you're, you know, if your work is not pictured, it is meant to be pictures. It just eventually PowerPoint has you know, limitations on, on space. A lot of exciting work. And this includes work in the database group at the University of Washington. We have a project, we've had it for several years. It's called Visual World Data Management. And in that project, we are looking at video data management and all these different layers in the stack. And I'm going to talk about that today, starting from the storage layer and really asking the fundamental question of, well, if we have video data, how should we store it on disk? to make it easier to query. We have a couple of projects in this uh, space and I will talk about the TASM and the VSS storage managers. All the way up to the top where we ask and say, okay, how should we expose video data to applications? What kind of data models should we be providing? And with everything in between from query execution to uh, you know, um, uh, actually all the way to you know, data cleaning, uh, complex query processing uh, and even video benchmarking. So lots of exciting things Definitely a wide open space. And I'll be, uh, yeah, I'll be talking. If someone has a clarifying question, uh, feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, we will take kind of as usual the questions at the end. All right, so let's really get started and ask the first question. Given that we have videos, how should we be storing them to make them efficiently queryable? And we might think, well, maybe there's not that much to it. Video is so large, we just have to compress it and store it using standard formats. Uh, and that's true. But at the same time, there's actually a lot that we can do. And this is the work that I'll be presenting is uh, presented in our TASM paper that appeared recently and the paper and the code are available on our project website. And so fundamentally, let's first look and think about what are the requirements for a storage manager for video data, right? So if I have a video, clearly I want to be able to open it at the beginning and kind of read through it. I will likely be able, I will likely want to jump somewhere in the middle and you know, read some uh, chunk of the video at some you know, offset in time. Uh, but interestingly, I might also be interested in within a frame to only get some subset of the frame. Uh, one example here is you know, if I'm looking at videos of animals in nature, I don't need maybe necessarily the whole frame if I'm only interested in those animals. Or if I'm looking at an application that needs to detect you know, license plates, then I really want only the license plate. And you will tell me, well, Magda, if I query a database and it only shows me like the pixels that correspond to the license plate, I would likely want to see the car around it. And I would say, yes, the user at the end, yes. But if the application is going to be looking through videos and searching, for example, for a specific license plate, I don't need to extract all the cars and all the brick walls behind those cars if I just want to identify which of these license plates actually match my query. Once I find the match, then I probably want to go and retrieve the rest of the frame. But in the context of processing the data, there are many such scenarios where I actually only need a subset of the frame in order to answer uh, the query. So if we take these two requirements together, what we want is a storage manager that allows both you know, uh, predicates over time and predicates in space and returns the pixels associated with those, uh, those two predicates. And we'll add some more recurrence later, but let's just start with that. Uh, so if that's our goal, if that's our requirement, how can we build such a system? 
to really think about that, we need to pause and uh, kind of review how videos are en normally encoded. So a video is a sequence of uh, frames. And if let's say I want to find a dog somewhere in this video, I want to therefore do like a predicate and I want to find you know, the dog at a certain offset in time. And also the dog is in a certain location on the frame. How can I do this? Because videos are so large, we cannot store and you know, compress frames independently. They are going to be grouped in what are called groups of pictures. The first frame is going to be decodable by itself, but the subsequent frames in the same group of pictures have to be decoded kind of are dependent on that first frame. So if we want to find the pixels that correspond to the dog, we really have to start at the beginning of the group of pictures. We need to read from this and decode the first frame, the second frame and the third frame where we can finally find uh, the, uh, what we are looking for. Which of course, this means that we have actually read quite a bit of data and decoded it that we did not need to answer this query. And we want to do, of course, something better. So can we, avoid this type of overhead to get better performance. What's interesting is if you think about predicates over time, it's actually not a hard problem. You want these groups of pictures to be as small as possible, subject to not having kind of an explosion in terms of the space that the video is going to be using. And typically in many systems, the default will be something like one second. And our experiments have shown that optimizing this was not really affecting performance very much. The more interesting problem, and what I will be talking over the next few slides, is how to support predicates in space. And what's interesting here and the key idea behind our approach is to use a recent codec feature called tiling. So we actually can take frames and tell the system don't encode the frame as one blob, but please split it into tiles and encode each tile independently. Because if we do that, we will be able to retrieve from disk and decode only the tiles that we need. So in our example, if we do the tiling around the dog for this group of picture, uh, then we will be able to only start from the beginning of that group of picture and only decode the tile that corresponds to the dog. We might still have some overhead. The tile might still be bigger than the, what we are looking for, but the overhead is going to be much less. And as we will see later, this actually significantly impacts performance for queries. So that's the key idea behind our storage manager called TASM. It stands for Tile Aware Storage Manager. So it's a storage manager that is going to take videos and it's going to tile it. Uh, and it's going to allow queries uh, that will ask for predicates over time and predicates in space. Instead of asking, instead of exposing predicates that ask the upper layers to know where the objects are located and only request data in terms of you know, uh, pixel uh, uh, offsets, we're actually exposing an API that allows applications to query and ask directly for objects. Like I would like to find all of the cars in the following five minutes of the video. Uh, and of course, you know, the storage manager by itself doesn't run an object detector. So we also have a API call that allows the upper layers uh, to inform the storage manager whenever they find such objects and the storage manager is going to use that information. Uh, there are several interesting challenges around this uh, type of project. The most important one is how do we optimize the tiling layout? So here's an example where we have a picture with some birds. And if we use one tiling, the one on the left, uh, we actually have tiles kind of cut across the birds. Uh, we also have the number of tiles kind of doesn't align, which means the amount of work we will have to do is going to be greater for the tiling on the left than for the tiling on the right. And in general, there are a lot of optimizations that we want to do around tiling. Uh, there's different objects in videos. These objects move over time. Uh, but what's also hard is at the beginning, when we are given a video, we don't know what objects are in it. Uh, we don't know what the user is going to be querying for. It might be that this is, you know, maybe it's a traffic monitoring application and users only want to query for cars. Maybe it's the same traffic monitoring video, but the user is only interested in pedestrians and so forth. So at the beginning, we don't know the object location. We don't know what the query will be doing. Objects will be moving. They could be any size. They could be dense or sparse. We don't know any of it. We could say, you know, let's actually just scan through the video once, detect all the objects in all the frames, index them and tile around all of these objects. And then, you know, we're ready to do query processing. That's definitely one baseline we compare against, but it adds tremendous overheads. It's possible that users will never query for some of these objects or some of these regions, uh, and then we're not going to get the same kind of performance. So instead, what doesn't does is to, uh, 
tile the video incrementally and dynamically in response to the workload. So TASM is going to start with the video. So here we have, for example, a video that has these, you know, uh, four groups of pictures. Uh, initially, none of them will be tiled. And as the queries start to execute, as we find what objects are in those tiles, uh, sorry, what objects are in those groups of pictures in those frames, what objects uh, queries are asking about, then we're going to tile these different groups of pictures. TASM decides how to tile each group of picture independently of the others. Um, it only retains one copy of a group of picture. We don't do any view materialization. So it's really just the physical tuning of this one uh, video that we have. View materialization would be kind of an interesting uh, next step to explore. And it's possible that some groups of pictures end up with the same tiling, but really we're going to treat them independently from one another. More specifically, here's how the system works. So TASM here is on the left. And it's really meant to be a storage manager that works together with a query processing engine. So the user will ask a query, right? For example, I'm looking for dogs in the first 60 seconds of the video. Um, and as we saw yesterday, right? So a lot of these engines will then take the, the query processor, uh, will ask the storage manager and says, at the beginning, we don't know anything about objects. So it can only request the first 60 second of the video. But then through the query processing by answering the query, uh, to the user, we will have detected uh, the object locations. So the system at that point will actually do a call to TASM and say, hey, storage manager, for those first 60 seconds of the video, I actually found dogs at the following locations. TASM does two things. First, it has a semantic index where it remembers the location of the objects for different labels uh, and their bounding boxes in those frames. And second, it's going to say, well, I could have you know, really had a layout that tiled these groups of pictures around uh, the object of interest and that would have accelerated the query. And then as users ask for additional objects and submit additional queries, then we're going to learn about the position of more of these objects, remember it in the semantic index and consider additional layouts. So now how do we pick which layout to use? So for this, we actually use a simple regret-based technique. Uh, regret accumulation is an old technique that has been used in the database community in, in other contexts. Uh, and it works as follows. Every time a query asks for a certain object uh, in a certain group of pictures, we're going to compute the cost of the query, which really corresponds to how many tiles and how many pixels we need to uh, read from this kind of code. Uh, and we're going to compare the cost to what we would have paid for if we had used one of those tiling. So here, for example, for the first group of picture, we could say, if I execute the query without tiling versus tiling around dogs, tiling around cats, or tiling around both cats and dogs. Once we accumulate enough regret to um, uh, offset the cost of retiling, we're going to go ahead and retile the video. So how well does this work? This actually works uh, no, really well. We have a lot of experiments in the paper. Here's just one kind of illustrative graph. So this is a, a experiment where we used videos from the visual road benchmark, and we issued queries for either cars, people, or traffic lights, uh, more, uh, more likely querying cars for cars and people, and occasionally querying for traffic lights, and also querying, so skewing kind of the query for certain regions of uh, the video. Now what we see in the graph, so the blue line that goes straight up here, of this line, I think you can see my, my mouse, um, is what happens the query cost if we don't do any retiling. And we're going to use this as a normalization. So the cost without retiling for each query is going to be a cost of one. Uh, now what happens, the orange line shows what happens if we ahead of time go ahead and retile the whole video around all of the objects. So we have a very large kind of overhead at the beginning and then the queries are pretty fast uh, kind of as the, uh, um, uh, as the uh, user executes more query, but it takes a really, really long time for that overhead to get amortized. Uh, the other two lines, the red line here, which is the second one below the blue line, shows what happens if we eagerly retile every time the user queries for a region and some objects, we're going to retile around all of the objects that have been queried so far for that region. And as you can see, because we're not equally querying for all of the objects, this is not, this actually ends up paying a lot of unnecessary retiling overhead. Instead, this is what TASM does. So it kind of nicely uh, grows, the cost nicely grows with queries as they're executed uh, and definitely kind of converges towards what happens if we eventually query all the objects uh, in all of the tiles. But if the user stops querying anytime earlier, uh, then they have really saved a lot on the cost. 
And all of this is done automatically without the user having to do anything. They just kind of start to create their data. So that was kind of the exciting part of TASM. TASM, once again, is available. So you can download it, you can try it, you can use it. Uh, and the second question would be, okay, so then you have done this storage manager. Is that the end? Like, have we solved the problem of storing video data? And I'll give you a second example of a storage manager as an illustration that by far not. There are so many other opportunities uh, for uh, data storage in, uh, in video. Uh, and this is actually a second paper that appeared at Sigmod recently, uh, and it's called VSS, and it stands for the Video Storage System. And again, the paper and the code are also available on our project website. So the idea here for VSS is that in addition to querying for certain region in time and certain regions in space, the application actually needs to then retrieve the video. When the application retrieves the video, because videos are so large, in some cases, maybe the query processor might want the video just completely decoded because they want to do additional processing. But in many cases, applications will say, well, I would like that chunk of the video with a certain frame rate, a certain resolution, and a certain kind of encoding. And because we are database people, we want to provide physical data independence. So we don't want applications to have to worry about transcoding videos across these different formats. We want to hide all of this information. So VSS offers exactly this feature, and this is how it works. So here we have VSS at the bottom, uh, and VSS will store some videos. These are kind of these long rectangles here, or the videos. Uh, initially, we have the videos in whatever original format they were uh, ingested. Uh, when we start to receive, so this is storage manager, when the storage manager starts to receive requests for videos, these requests are going, just like in TASM, ask for a certain region in time and a certain region in space. Uh, but are also going to specify kind of the other physical properties like the frame rate, resolution, and the encoding. So what the system will do is we're going to find what the user is looking for, and we're going to transform it, transcode it into uh, the format that they want, and you're going to return it. So here the query is going to ask for cars at a certain you know, time in the video, uh, the Q1A, Q1B, Q1C are those three regions, we're going to read them. Uh, and here this goes to the query processor. So we read, we decode, we return. Another query comes, uh, asks for cars at other locations. Interestingly here, because we have some overlap with the previous request, because we are going to cache as much as we can of these fragments. So here, in addition to the uh, original version of the video, we have a cache that is going to accumulate all these different fragments that you have generated over time for different queries. We can now answer the new query by looking at everything we have in the cache and finding the least cost way to answer that query. And finally, here we have another uh, query that comes from not a query processor, but directly an application that just wants some fragment in maybe kind of an older uh, format. We will once again be able to answer that query by looking and using all of these uh, existing uh, fragments. So that's the bottom kind of the key idea in uh, VSS. Uh, and there's ex a lot of experiments in the paper, but fundamentally we see that read performance gains can be in the 30 to 50%, which is quite significant uh, just for, uh, uh, avoid kind of, of course, it's thanks to this caching mechanism, but it's quite a significant performance gain. But also importantly, the application doesn't have to worry about any of this. The application just makes calls to the system and says, this is the data that I want uh, in, uh, in the following format. And VSS goes actually one step over. As you can see here, we showed that some of the videos overlap. And we had that conversation, I think, yesterday, that in some camera deployments, I might have multiple cameras that are pointing at the same intersection, multiple cameras that are pointing at you know, overlapping lanes in a highway. So when we do this, of course, we don't want to store all of those you know, pixels redundantly. Uh, and VSS optimizes this redundancy away automatically. The way we do this, is when the user just gives us videos, right? They ingest videos into the storage manager. Um, VSS does two things. First, it clusters the videos and using something simple, just, you know, color histograms. Because here, since we're looking at actually perfect overlap, we're really, it's kind of easier to identify uh, that things. If the colors don't match, they don't overlap, we're going to leave them alone. When we have overlapping regions, VSS computes kind of how, uh, kind of the degree, kind of the differences in, in the angular position of the cameras and generates from the two overlapping videos, generates three files, the non-overlapping part of the first video, the non-overlapping part of the second video, and then the jointly compressed and stored 
overlapping part of the two uh, videos. And again, in this case, it's not a performance gain for queries, it's mostly just st storage savings that we don't have to store the data redundantly. And once again, if we do that, the applications don't have to worry about it. They don't have to give us any metadata about the position of their cameras. All of this happens automatically. Uh, so lots of kind of really exciting, I think, uh, questions around storage. Uh, I bet that while I was talking, you came up with three, four new ideas of other ways to improve storage management for video data. This is important because video data is so voluminous that when we can make improvements here, it actually impacts applications. So the second question that we have asked and that I'd like to raise today is, okay, so we have talked about the storage and you have seen some potential, you know, exciting opportunities for optimizing and, you know, physically tuning the storage. What happens all the way at the top? In the case of a video application, what kind of data model should we be exposing to applications? And this is work that we have done a little bit earlier, a couple of years ago, in the context of a project called LightDB. And the paper and the code are also available on our project website. So if we think about relational, uh, if we think about video data, and for example, we think about the session yesterday, we can see that we can actually use pretty much a relational model for applications on top of video data with extensions, right, of course. But fundamentally, the way we can view this is that we have a video with frames. We need to run some functions, right? So kind of the system has to have functions. The user can likely override those functions to run different object detectors and detect the content of the video. Once we do this, we basically have kind of a relational uh, database. And there are different ways to create the schemas, but one example would be to have, you know, the objects uh, that are detected in each frame with their bounding boxes. We can have a column for uh, the actual pixels in the data. We can have another you know, table for the relationships between objects uh, and so on. If we want to uh, reason over time, we can think about intervals uh, and use this kind of uh, algebra. Uh, we can think about 3D bounding boxes. And this is what a lot of systems use today. And that works really well for many uh, kinds of applications. And of course, we don't have to materialize the data. This could be virtual tables, as we heard about uh, yesterday. Um, but fundamentally, this actually works really well. And the question is, well, OK, is that the best model for video data? Or is that the only model for video data? So we asked this question, but we actually started to look at two kinds of uh, interesting videos which are uh, 360 degree videos and light field videos. And I'm going to give you an example of those videos. For those on Zoom, you won't see the, it will be in another window. So I don't think you will see it, but I pasted the links into the chat so you can view it you know, on their own time. So let me see if that works. I think they're here. Okay, so this is the first one. So this is a video. And as you can see, it's kind of a video with sharks. But what's interesting is I can actually move this and realize, well, wow, behind me, there's all these people. Uh, but maybe they're not interested. Interesting. So I'm going to kind of go back and look at the sharks again. Uh, and this is one example of a 360 video. It's captured by, you need at least two cameras. Often you can have a rig of cameras that will capture a video from different angles and will be able to recreate kind of the sphere and will... Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I'm sure this was interesting what they were going to say there. Um, and this is not the only example. So in the computer uh, graphics, uh, computer vision communities, they actually do something even more powerful than 360 video, and these are called light field videos. And this is one illustration here. You, I think it's a bit hard to tell, but what happens with light field videos is not only the uh, viewer is going to look around, they're also, also going to move in a small box. So they will be able to move left and right, uh, and look everywhere and they're going to actually be able to see kind of the scene from different angles and orientations, but even also different positions of the viewers within a small space. Uh, so this is really, okay, let me go back. Um, so this is really cool. And then the question is, well, if we think about these kinds of applications, uh, what kind of data model should we be providing to them? The reason why this is hard is because in many of these applications, the position of the viewer and their orientation where they're looking at is really important. One simple application uh, is to say, I want to save energy on this you know, wireless headset. So what I want to do is send what the user is currently looking at in high resolution or high bitrate, but everything else, they're not really looking at it. I can really compress it more strongly and not really, uh, and then therefore have savings. So I really need a way to 
reason about where the user is looking at. And I really don't want to worry about how that sphere is projected onto a 2D frame and how this matches onto like no pixels in a kind of regularly encoded video. So to support these applications, and there's kind of many of them, right? From 360 videos, light field, mixed reality, augmented reality. We have developed a data model uh, that is um, where the fundamental object is a light field, a temporal light field. So we actually model each frame of a video directly as a sphere. And that sphere can of course evolve over time. And we can even, if we union videos, then we end up having the union of multiple such spheres. Um, uh, and if the uh, fundamentally when the, someone is uh, going to create a new video, they're going to create this new light field and they are able to address it both through the XYZ coordinates of the position of the viewer, but also the angles of uh, viewing and then time. And that, uh, if they do that, they will get both the kind of the color and the light intensity for that pixel uh, at that time. Uh, what is exciting is once we do this, then building applications become so much more natural. And of course, because we have a new data model, we have a new algebra that provides operations like selections, transformations, you know, partitioning, unioning, different uh, light field. And with this, we can now uh, actually express this application that I used as an illustrative example at the beginning of the talk completely declaratively by saying, here, you know, I want to decode my video of sharks. I want to also scan this, you know, watermark video that I had previously already inserted in the system. I want to union them. I want to uh, then, you know, change uh, the colors to grayscale, and then I want to write them out in a certain format. What the system does is goes from the declarative query to a logical query plan. The mapping in LightDB is pretty direct. So the user is basically expressing uh, kind of the, the logical uh, query plan. The transformation is, uh, is pretty much aligned to one-to-one -to -one mapping. But what's interesting is now, of course, we can do optimizations under the cover. So here, for example, if the system has multiple GPUs, we can uh, express this application, optimize it, and execute it in parallel across these GPUs and get a much better performance in terms of frames per second. And of course, the user can go directly and manually implement the application, manually implement those optimizations. But as we know, we don't want the user to have to do this. With a system such as this one, the user can uh, has access to this, uh, these powerful optimizations automatically. And this is kind of one example that with video data, there actually are opportunity to explore these different kind of data models for different uh, applications. So now, okay, so we have the storage level, we have the data model. Well, what goes really in between? And I won't really talk about that much because in between, of course, we want to have a full stack that goes from query to query execution. For LightDB in our stack, since we, uh, this was a partnership with colleagues in computer architecture, they implemented all kinds of exciting hardware accelerators. So a lot of it was about a rule-based optimizer that could leverage these hardware accelerators. But we definitely, I think, have a lot of opportunities. And we also heard it from you know, the other speaker yesterday, a lot of opportunities thinking about how we can rebuild the stack for video data management. Uh, the other thing is in, in uh, in addition to thinking bottom up, we also want to think end to end. Uh, and this was our talk yesterday, so I won't repeat it here. I will invite people to view it if you haven't uh, seen it already. But we want to support users from starting with whatever videos they have, which might be dirty videos. They might have no deep learning models or other models developed for detecting anything interesting in those videos, supporting them all the way to answering complex queries over those videos. So again, kind of lots of opportunities uh, in that space. And now you can, so okay, Magda, are you really, are you finally done? And I will say no, there's actually one more thing here, which is benchmarking. For any community to make progress uh, in a space, it's always very useful to have benchmarks. For video data early on, when we started on this path, we were wondering where, how are we going to make sure that we evaluate our systems in a way where we don't kind of, you know, skew the evaluation to just show what are the benefits of what we are doing. So we developed this uh, benchmark. Uh, it's called Visual Road because it's all about cars driving around. Uh, it's also available on our website and some people have been uh, using it. The way this works is that it's actually built on the Carla Autonomous Driving Simulator. Um, the scale of the benchmark means the size of the city. Each tile in the city is about a few kilometers, squared kilometers. Uh, there's a database of tiles and the system is going to pull these tiles from the database uh, and it's going to put them together in a, kind of to create the larger city. Uh, in each tile, we have you know, different buildings, different road segments, we have different densities of traffic. Uh, we can also adjust the city to have different you know, weather conditions. So there are many parameters that are possible. And then we insert cameras 
all throughout the city. And the system basically kind of simulates those cars, pedestrians, bicycles driving around, uh, and the cameras are going to record these videos in the city. And those are going to be the videos that the video data management systems have to process. Uh, then on the other hand, we have a set of benchmark queries. The benchmark includes both micro benchmarks, so queries that says, okay, find the objects, uh, blur those regions, or extract those other regions, and macro uh, queries that are going to say, okay, we need to actually find the objects, draw bounding boxes, and save the video that has the annotation of the bounding boxes around the objects. This is an exciting and super useful benchmark. We have been definitely using it quite a lot. Um, but Devin is something that I think the community can expand upon. So we can probably come up with new queries, you know, more complex videos, and just have even more exciting benchmarks that we can use uh, in this type of work. All right, so in conclusion, uh, video data management has really emerged as a really important area. There's a ton of opportunities for our community. Uh, many groups have already been doing exciting work, but I think quite a lot of work remains to be done. So I invite everyone to you know, join us in this, uh, in this research area. It's definitely super fun and you get to show videos in your talks, which is always nice. Uh, and more information about what I talked about today is on our project website. Uh, and I'll be very happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.